Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. There is a lot of noise in the system. And so this conversation is going to help us to navigate some of that noise, to separate the noise uh, from the reality. And the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to start off with a moderated conversation with our panelists. If you were to capture this moment as both a challenge and an opportunity for South Africa, what does this post-election moment represent for us as a country? It was irresponsible if you look at what happened to our economy today. It was irresponsible if you see how we were reported in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, in the FT as well. Um, so I feel like a whole lot of months and months of goodwill and extremely hard work was mm. undone, and undone quite irresponsibly. I must say, yesterday, the new dawn did feel like a bit of a feel-good distant memory to me. Mm. Not even a month after a good election, um, and a moment of hope, I feel like we are almost back in, in, the, in the last decade, the last decade. The last decade. So, Governor, let me, let me come to you. And I think if we go back to the theme of tonight's uh, conversation, rising above the noise, is the mandate under review? And can you categorically share with us what is the latest that you know of in terms of this ongoing narrative in the country? Well, I know what I have always known. Uh, and what I have always known is that institutions in a democracy matter. And quality institutions matter even more. Our constitution created particular institutions and tasked them with particular responsibilities. We created the South African Reserve Bank in terms of the Constitution and tasked it with protecting the value of the currency in the interest of balance and sustainable growth. That's where the mandate is derived from. But the Constitution gives the Reserve Bank a responsibility on growth. And the fathers and mothers of our Constitution were very clear that we need balanced and sustainable growth in the republic and that you will not be able to have balanced and sustainable growth in the republic mm. unless you have price stability. The authors of the constitution called price stability the protection of the value of the currency. And thus, the founding fathers and mothers of our democracy were cognizant of the fact that for you to get balanced and sustainable growth in the republic, a precondition for that is price stability. Mm. So price stability is a necessary condition for balance and sustainable growth in the republic, but it is not a sufficient condition. Other things have got to come into play right. uh, 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 to do that. And just to uh, uh, close this one off and say throughout today, I've been communicating a message that says, you cannot beat an economy that is on its knees and force it to create jobs. It's not going to happen. You have got to bring it up, get the economy to grow. Jobs are an outcome of economic growth. Absent economic growth, you can't have jobs. For you to get jobs, you must get growth. For you to get growth, you must have investment. For you to get investment, you need to create an environment for investment to take place. It's not a scientific discovery. There are local and international investors that are watching this performance on South African soil. Now, let's come back to where, what is the view from an investment perspective in this moment in time in the country? At, at the Goldman Sachs conference a couple of weeks ago, in the 40 or so minutes that the president spoke, he emphasized the need for growth probably 20 times. Um, at some point, he even said, it's the economy stupid. I mean, he was mm. fairly blunt about it. But that's not enough. Um, we're naturally skeptical. We have to be. We manage money. And it's the same for anybody else that's running money. We need to see evidence of a plan. And yesterday doesn't count. We, we're great, historically, at making plans. And we need to deliver on that. Which means, from a macro perspective, in terms of changing the outlook for the medium-term growth forecast from our perspective and possibly most of our competitors, 
we're not going to do it until at least a few months after the sonar. Right. So not a lot has changed yet from, from an investment perspective and from a long-term outlook perspective. I want to talk about expectations. From the ordinary South African, I'm, I'm, I'm called, of course, to think about the equation uh, that leads to the outcome of jobs that the governor has given us. Is this the most important thing on the minds of South Africans in terms of the expectation of this cabinet? So um, if we look at all the research done um, by the ANC during the election and by other parties, um, a couple of things are really interesting. Land did not come up as a major imperative, neither did the independence of the Reserve Bank come up as a top desire in the hearts of ordinary South Africans. What did come up tops was jobs across parties, EFFDA and the ANC mm -hmm. research, um, and into corruption, um, definitely housing, um, those were the things that South Africans are worrying about and thinking about um, for their own pockets, for their own aspirations and their lives. I want to first come back to the idea of not only a renewal of the country, but a renewal and a resetting of the institutions that enable the country to function. Do you get a sense that there is an expectation from ordinary South Africans, from investors and other audiences that this moment in history also represents an opportunity for us to reset and review the strengths of our institutions that safeguard democracy? Uh, you know, um, Nazipo, <coughs> institutions had been systematically weakened and in some instances gutted. The barbarians did arrive at the Reserve Bank but they didn't come from the direction we expected them to come from. Sure. <laughs> and when the barbarians arrived at the Reserve Bank, it went something like, let us change the mandate of the Reserve Bank. And that has got to be seen in the context of a systematic attack uh, on institutions. And many of the institutions do stand their grounds, and commendably so. Because if these institutions are saving South Africans, South Africans should actually be standing up in defense of the institutions. Right. The expectations in terms of maybe the top three burning issues yeah. that investors are going to be tracking, and whether you think that this cabinet that we have um, has got what it takes to hit or maybe even surpass some of those expectations. Yeah. Okay, if, if we were to narrow it down to three, the SAAB wouldn't be one of the things at, at all that needs fixing. Um, two would be ESCOM, and, and we'll get into the details as to why they get two. Um, and the other is uncertainty ar around land. And so what I mean by, by two for ESCOM, one is on the production side. Uh, we, we track the energy availability factor quite closely. It's a percentage of total capacity that's available for production at any given point in time. And that number's been pretty low. And here we can rely on some of the work from the SAAB and trying to get a link between that number and growth in South Africa. And so based on some of the analysis from the Saab, if that number averages around 65% for the year, then we're not going to grow by much, just a bit over 50 bips or so, call it. Um, if that number is 60%, then we're not growing at all, and it's going to be at naught. Um, based on the work that ESCOM has done, if it's over 73% or so, then we can get moderate growth, so call it a percent, somewhere around there which means that you, you can't get a forecast for growth in South Africa unless you've got an idea of where that energy availability factor is and where it's going to go. Now, year-to-date, it's averaging 65. If it continues in the same process, we grow at half a percent or so if we're lucky and everything else remains constant with the risk of a downgrade. If it goes to 70, then we can grow a bit more. So the first focus has to be to get that number up. And, and the good news is the last five weeks, that number has been over 70. The problem is three of those weeks were ahead of an election. So we need to discount that possibly a little bit. So we've got two weeks of genuinely above 70. And we keep a close eye on that. And the real test for ESCOM is actually now. It's as you hit winter. This is the time period, and go back over time, where you see a spike in demand. Guys switch on their heaters, sometimes underfloor heaters. Um, and electricity demand shoots up, and ESCOM gets tested. Which means that if we are able to meet the challenge of the next couple of months, then we're fine from that side, we can grow a bit faster. But that's the first concern, keeping the lights on. Yeah. Absolutely. And we monitor on a weekly basis. The second is the debt issue with ESCOM. 500 billion rands of debt or so. The problem is servicing that debt. There's no apparent plan as to how that's going to happen. We, we don't know what it is. And the third is land. It is a concern in the background. And in some cases, it's holding back investment. We just need clarity. We need to know exactly what's going to happen. We know what the commitment has been thus far, but it needs to be on paper and it needs to be passed.
If we look at the uh, first quarter GDP number that came out yesterday, down by 3.2%, and I think the reports are saying that this is the biggest quarterly drop we've seen in a decade. Great. So clearly, ESCOM and the health of our state-owned enterprises broadly are a huge risk to fiscal stability. Yeah. One thing, two, three if you have, that the president could focus on that would also communicate to the investment community that they are serious about reducing this risk of ESCOM to the economy. Yeah, we, we, we know from communication from Praveen Gordon before that uh, the president does receive a report every morning, half past seven, with all the power plants, exactly what the issues are. And so they're on top of it to some degree. They know what the problems are. We know that a report was written on all the power stations and submitted to uh, Praveen Gordon a couple of weeks ago. We need to see what the result of that is and, and what the actual plan is to go and ensure that that energy availability factor remains sufficiently above 75 to see growth. The issue with the growth numbers isn't the numbers that attract the headlines, the minus 3.2%, the down 10% for mining, the down 8% for manufacturing. The issue is nominal growth in South Africa at the moment, year on year, is 4.1%. Okay, that's the lowest number we've seen since back in the 60s. The problem with that is what's in the budget is 7%. And so if we're doing much worse than what's in the budget, naturally your debt to GDP numbers are going to be worse than what was in the budget, which means we push out the point at which debt to GDP stabilizes, which means we face a risk of a downgrade. <coughs> we have to do everything we can to get nominal GDP growth closer to 7%. I want to get to the international environment and the, and the global context broadly, but before we go there, I think there is this underlying yes. narrative that's taking place in the country. Is it a trend yet, and is it worth, uh, worth worrying about at this time? I, I think, Nozi, I'm thinking about this today a lot. I think we have an effective five finance ministers in South Africa, and it's extremely confusing. So you have President Ramaphosa running aspects of policy with a number of reference groups. You've got um, Tito Mboweni, the finance minister. You've got public enterprises, Minister Praveen Gordon, very often acting like a finance minister. Mm -hmm. You today had Enoch Godongwana sounding like he was the finance minister. And then you have Ace Mahashule as well. Mm -hmm. So I do think, uh, it's, and it gets extremely confusing, and I think investors begin sitting on their money. Um, so I do think that needs, the lines need clarifying, yeah. and the communication certainly needs massive improvement. Now, the, the, the additional narrative that's been happening in the last 24 to 48 hours, and maybe even longer, is that the Reserve Bank should come through and uh, through QE make a way of making funds available through a developmental agenda. Please, can you separate the noise from the reality for us once again? The central bank has got a particular responsibility. And our responsibility is price stability. Last year, we got given a responsibility of a financial stability. The constitution says that if the Reserve Bank is assigned any additional it must be captured in a national piece of law and must be consistent with its primary objective. Mm -hmm. And so that, that takes uh, away the noise. I, I'm sure there are knowledgeable people uh, in the room here, uh, but for the lawyers who do not understand what QE is, let's just uh, go through. <laughs> Back to school. <laughs> for quantitative, quantitative easing as a policy option, all central banks have, including us. To embark on a process of quantitative easing, two conditions must be met. The first condition is that inflation must be so low that it threatens to go below zero. In other words, you are facing a threat of deflation. And we know that if you have deflation, you will kill consumption because people would say, why should I buy today if I can buy tomorrow because tomorrow's prices will be less than today's prices? That's the first condition. The second condition should be that the central bank tried so much to combat deflation that the central bank dropped interest rates to the point that interest rates are close to zero. Mm. And because they are so close to zero, had become now effective in influencing both investment and uh, borrowing, uh, borrowing decisions. And then, of course, um, We've got to understand them. Do these conditions hold in South Africa? 
inflation in East South Africa is far from zero. It's 4.4 percent. Uh, interest rates are not at zero. Uh, 6.75 in real terms. Looking forward to uh, the first quarter of uh, next year, you are talking of interest rates 2.75 in real terms. Mm. So let's get this one clear. Quantitative easing is not an option uh, for South Africa because you do not meet mm. the conditions for quantitative, uh, for quantitative easing. So let's go, let's go internationally, Chris. Yeah. Can you bring this, all, bring this all home for us in terms of the impact that this has on the attractiveness of South Africa as an investment destination? Sure. So I think globally th there are two major themes playing out at the moment. Um, the one links with inflation. I if you look at major countries, so the US and Europe and some others too, you'll find that inflation is consistently surprising on the downside and has been for some time. So the pressure is off their central banks to hike. Inadvertently, that means the pressure is off our central bank to hike. That's what I'm saying, not, not necessarily the central bank. <laughs> um, and and may, even, may even cut a, a, at some point. Um, yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Anyhow, so, so glo globally, no, no real sign of inflation. The Fed, uh, what's priced in now is close to 100% probability of the Fed cutting by the end of the year. There's a 50% probability that they're going to cut by July. So that side of things, very good for SA, reduces some of the pressure on SA. The other major theme is the tariff story, um, and there it's not as good. It, it raises uncertainty for emerging markets in general, and typically when there is increased uncertainty, we get punished. Maybe it's unfair, but we do get punished. The RAND weakens, our long bond yields move up. And from that, the, the, the picture at the moment isn't looking that great. It looks like the major protagonists are, are settling in for a long battle. Um, if we talk about the US versus China, um, we can see from both sides that they're getting ready. So building on this, Feral, from a trade perspective and where this leaves South Africa in terms of the balance of trade, what is the impact uh, that we need to be looking at uh, as, these, uh, as, as these global trends and these global conversations are unfolding? Um, were you at the Investment Summit last year? Yes. I think so. It was such a wonderful day. I think I saw several of, of you there. And the goodwill towards South Africa was really interesting from a range of foreign investors who had come, often especially for the day. Um, by the end of the day, President Ramaphosa had clocked up 253 billion rand in investment promises. Um, I've heard his advisors say that almost half of that is in the ground already. So what that tells you is that we were really in quite a sweet spot in a troubled world. And what worries me about this past week is we've become like chokers. <laughs> so, Governor, again, we've been looking at uh, having a very localized conversation this evening, but I, I don't doubt that from time to time you also lift your head and look at what's unfolding and playing out on the global landscape. What are the big global conversations that are either keeping you awake at night or giving you confidence about where we are as a country? Uh, three uh, 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 important points. The first one has to do clearly with the trade uh, uh, tensions. Uh, I have this burden of, ch of chairing the IMF's policy committee, and because of that, I constantly have to watch what the global developments are. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the sake of me, I can find the logic in the trade tensions. So you want access to the markets of other countries, but you don't want them to access your own markets. It's illogical. Uh, but um, uh, uh, who said that uh, logic is an important part of a political discourse? It is not. <laughs> uh, so, 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 everyone from the OECD to the IMF to the World Bank had revised growth, mm. global growth downward. The one common denominator had been the impact of this global uh, trade tension. Mm. Now, for a small open economy like South Africa, this becomes uh, crucial. The second one uh, that uh, worries us, which nobody seems to have been raising, but as uh, somebody who sits in these global meetings I have got to raise, had been the rise of covenant light corporate debt. Hmm. And when you look at the statistics in the US and see how much has been issued by low investment grade corporates, mm. you've got to say that there has got to be a concern here. But if you get out of the US and get into the emerging market economies, you will find that 
the rise in debt in emerging market economies has also been driven by foreign currency, mainly dollar-denominated mm. uh, debt. And when these things get raised, it says that uh, a tick, that's one area South Africa is doing very well. Uh, South African businesses do not like uh, the risk associated with foreign currency denominated mm. debt. So the, extent, the amount of foreign currency denominated debt issued by South African corporates is not, is not uh, uh, that big. And let me just conclude then. And say that in the aftermath of the global financial crisis when the advanced economies embarked on quantitative easing, Capital started to flow to emerging market countries. South Africa also mm. benefited from that. And we behaved as if we were richer than what we actually were. Yeah. And not only that, we binged on debt uh, because we were providing a fiscal stimulus. It was the correct thing to do at that time. The conversation South Africans should have is who captured that stimulus because it didn't have the desired yeah. effect because some rent seekers mm. actually captured a significant part sure. of that stimulus. Mm. Huge conversation that you're surfacing, a conversation that needs to continue.